you very much, all three of you. Do we have any questions from the floor? Oh, oh, uh, yes, I think you were actually very interesting talks. I wanted to ask about the right to them, which I cross across both of you. There's a specific question which is about the Scottish research, which was what was the sample size of the survey responses versus the interviews? Because obviously the interviews, I think, were total of 11 people. And there seemed to be a slight um, almost contradiction between the reported net positives from the surveys because we were seeing like plus 30, plus 35 in terms of is this a good tool to find out what the citizens think, do I think this is good, versus the anecdotal responses. And just linked to that, the, it was almost framing a case that it's basically essentially a tool for cut and paste campaigning messages. And that again seems somewhat at odds with the deprivation index information that Alex has shown, because it might be an erroneous and sweeping generalization on my part, but my perception of the kind of people who do cut and paste campaign emails are more likely to be in less deprived areas, and that people writing to their local councillors in more deprived areas are more likely to be talking about issues that concern them. So the, the first question is really around that, that sample size point, and then reflections upon both of you particularly Alex's view as well, about the stats of the usage of the sample. Should I answer straight away? Yeah, you should first. I don't find some stats on this one. Indeed. Um, so, a decent response rate from the survey. The, mm, uh, the survey responses in terms of party membership and gender were sort of mirrored Scottish Parliament and the composition of local councils in Scotland. Um, and you're right in saying that uh, the interviews provide only anecdotal anecdotal papers. Oh, sorry, I mean, what, how many, what was the actual number of survey responses? Well, I had the numbers of 41% in, in one case. And oh, that was that was a response rate. What was, yeah. the, what was the total number of actual individual responses? Okay, so the Parliament has 100 countries. Oh, so you, you would have that one. Ah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Indeed, all MSPs were contacted, and yeah. I chose six local council areas, two urban, two rural, two mixed, um, and all of them, all of, I don't know, uh, all of those members were contacted. I didn't go to all 32 local authority areas. Yeah. Couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, and you're right, there seems to be a contradiction in terms of the more positive slant um, from the survey to the more negative slant in the interviews. I must have been maybe in the, in the presentation I gave maybe the, um, the negative bits from the interviews a slighter emphasis than I should have done and that I did in the paper uh, to maybe to also raise the issues that I see with, with right to them. Um, the question about the fact that uh, there seem to be lots of um, copy and paste emails, so not personal stuff that went into the contacts, into the emails to representatives, yeah, you're totally right. Um, it, just, it seems to be a tool for the middle classes to drive home a message from organizations they are associated with. Um, Council has told me, and so did the MSPs, that much of the contact, as you said, is via normal email, and often, I mean, it is the phone, and, and it is the letter, it is the, the surgery, the one-on-one the one -on -one meeting that, um, in which they see people who are from a more deprived background. Uh, my only thing on there is just looked up the distribution for right now to any piece, I'm sorry. Uh, that the, um, yeah, the deprivation is as expected from the national picture, so roughly speaking, more, more people are writing in Scotland from better off areas than in worse off areas, so roughly speaking, that does transport down to Scotland quite nicely.
related to that, um, you know, I wanted to know whether you think about this platform of like uh, the writing fee or the pieces. How much is, is complementary and how much is substitute for the petition websites that we see, you know, other writing about things that are different from you know, what you just see when you know, people get upset about this and they use them like this, they, they, they add in any petition. The, the third question that is related to, um, to, 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 to all that, um, have you looked at um, how uh, the type of messaging and uh, uh, both the type of messaging and the intensity of messaging might vary with, say, things like the electoral cycle or how they vary with like, big political effects? Big political because, like, you know, again, we didn't see that in the analysis. I have other things to work with, but I don't want to capture that. Sure. Uh, on content, we have essentially right to them is quite privacy sensitive because obviously these are people's messages, they're representative, they can be quite. Uh, Does that work? Does that work? Hello? 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 Yeah. Okay, cool. Roughly. Okay. Uh, so, yes, on content, a right to them is quite privacy sensitive in that the content of this message is quite, quite sensitive. So the policy is it's retained for several weeks for legal reasons if we need to follow up with a complaint, and then the content is wiped from the database. And so we're quite generally reluctant to analyze the content directly. We sort of have rough plans at some point in the future to maybe do surveys to them asking about the content or to approach it the other way around and to analyze what the content that representatives say they are receiving in terms of switching it to broad themes. Uh, obviously there is great research in analyzing the content, but the risks to the perception of the service that we don't want people, we, if we feel even if we took sort of certain measures to reassure ourselves of the privacy implications, if we publish things that even suggest we are reading people messages, that would be quite damaging to the service, even if we've taken safeguards for it. So in general, we're incredibly reluctant to sort of approach that kind of thing, interesting as it would be. Um, sorry, there's a, I've got a note on type of messaging. What did you mean by that? Oh, the ti sorry, timing. Yes, I've done some very basic stuff looking at this, nothing really systematic yet. I was sort of looking at the people who received the most messages and trying to see if there were patterns to that. And you can roughly, I certainly saw uh, some spikes. We were trying to work out why they existed. We think there was a spike just prior to the um, submission of Article 50 to MPs. Um, there's a few others that sort of make sense roughly in a Brexit time scale. Um, but there will, these, of course, be certain MPs will get messages from different kinds of people. But you can roughly see time effects in it. We haven't looked into that much detail yet, but they are there to be found. That's entirely, oh, the, 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 so the trouble would be a pre-election spike is we turn it off before elections, because especially MPs become, don't become MPs, sorry, MPs stop being MPs in the run-up to an election, so there's less grounds for that kind of spike. But certainly that kind of thing, we would probably expect like a post-election spike or a political event spike. So I, I think it's there to be found, yes. As in uh, action on by the designers of the website. Yeah, have you, have you combined this with sort of like user techniques to make improvements to the service? Not especially. I mean, this is sort of the ongoing question in our research stuff: is how much of it can we relate back to improvements to the site? So, for instance, in the other session, with some of you may or may not have been, and I talked about an A/B test where we did change the design of the website to affect gender, and found absolutely nothing. And similarly, if the problem is, as you found, that there is problems upstream, that it's hard to see what, if anything, we could change the design to do. Well, Sorry, yeah. No, this, this is a certain thing. So um, looking at, because some of the co-brands we run with local councils restrict the type of reporting. And when that happens, like uh, there's one, I can't remember the example, that is mostly interested in directly 
in road problems, and when you analyze that data, it's almost entirely male, as you would expect from your road versus walking thing. So absolutely, yes, there is sort of the, the, the selection of categories does affect what's going on there, and a lot of it will just get lost in mix, in the mis category I sort of assign it. But the other problem in analyzing this data, as you probably found, is that we don't have universal names for things. We reflect council names, and so you have to reinvent every time. So essentially, there will be content here, and it'll be lost in the description or the name that will be better able to pull this apart. And you're right, if we approach Fix My Street, essentially like 30 different sites for reporting different kinds of problems, that would raise design questions, and that would be interesting. So the, the answer is yes, but no, we're not doing it. But we should. All right, I think we've just got time for the final two questions. Should we go to the same person? Yes, sir. Uh, I think my question is mostly for Rebecca. I don't know if I'm asking that correctly. Uh, so much of the research that I've seen on crowdsourcing is focused on the participation of the users and less so on those who receive the reports and are meant to respond to them in some sort of way. Have you been looking at responsiveness or how it is that the responders use this information or are you aware of other researchers' literature that are looking at that? Um, I know that, so you guys feed back on the website as to what percentage of the, the issues that were raised have been addressed. And yes. So there's a, there's a table on that. Um, and I know that, so it's the councils that incorporate the site into their council website that do the best, because I guess they have some sort of investment um, in, in, in responding to it best. But uh, I haven't looked into any sort of correlates of what else means that people respond to this or not. Um, I think for, uh, yeah, I think maybe you might be better placed to speak about the councils and, and their their responses in terms of that. I would confess I don't know much about that aspect of it, but certainly there has been some stuff, um, except we have a few papers about the New York system, which do look at sort of which things get reflected on based on the kinds of reports. So I've got a literature review summary I could say during that one. Yes, that, that does cover the answer to your question. And the final question. Yeah, I think the same is the same. It's very dangerous of responsiveness. Would you guys look and I mean, because I was interested in just just even to make a parallel to say fascinating tenant, right? So they will start uh, in what people the, the participation side will seem to be a little bit studied from that. In what case local experiments further, but then I think that is easy to do. But getting people to respond to hard stuff. So No, that would be reasonably easy to find out, actually. That should be possible with what I've already done. There's certainly no gender difference in terms of responsiveness to MPs. So if I can break and rerun that same analysis and fix my trick to and answer the question. I suspect you probably wouldn't find that directly, except in so much that the, some categories are, this is sort of the problem, when gender is so batched up in the reporting categories, it's very hard to work out what is a gender effect and what is a reporting effect, because some categories are easier to fix than others. And so if those have been reported more on one side than the other, then that would correspondingly change the gender answer. So it's, it's hard to untangle. Not impossible, but it's tricky. All right, just time to say thank you very much to our three speakers. <laughs>